Well, we are continuing our series on Genesis, and, and hopefully it's been a good series for you. Uh, we've talked a little bit through the four themes not just of the beginning of the story, but God's whole story, his meta-narrative. And we talked about the first one, creation. And we said, in the beginning, God created, and it was was good. And he created humanity, and it was very good. It was Uh, He created humanity with a purpose to move his uh, creation, to multiply it, and to take care of it. So we had a purpose in the creation. And then lately we've been talking a little bit about this whole rebellion side, that sin entered the picture and it changed the story. By the way, can you feel the effect of sin in the change of the story each and every day of your life? Yeah, right? You can feel it. You can feel it when you have pain and struggle and there's relationship tensions and all that stuff. That's not the way it was created to be. We feel that change. We talked about this with Adam and Eve and the way that changed in the story. We talked about it with Noah and the things that were going on. We talk, Pastor Joe talked about it last week with the, power, uh, the Tower of, of Babel. And in the midst of this, he said this. There was a group of people that said, we want to make our name great. We're going to stay here and build a tower, and it's about us. And God said, that's not the way it is. We're going to see this a little bit within the call of Abraham today. Uh, and then he said, I'm going to redeem this. The story is broke, and I'm going to fix it, and I'm going to send someone to redeem it. We see that in Genesis 3.16 was the promise that he sent one day that the devil is going to crawl and face defeat all the days of his life. And then we get to this thing of restoration, which we know is the end of the story in Revelations. Uh, But before we get there, and before we get to one of my favorite stories in all of Scripture, which is this call of Abram, who later becomes Abraham, I want to start with asking this question. Uh, When you think about your friendships and the people that you commit to, how do you decide how deep your commitment is to those people? Because I'm guessing that not all the people in your life you've given the same commitment. Is that true? Like, you, there are some differences in that, right? Like, you don't treat everyone like they're your best friend. Your best friends get a little bit of a special uh, commitment to you, right? They get more of your time. They get more of your attention. They maybe get more of your prayers. And so there is a process of how much do we commit to different people in our life. And we think about Jesus. Jesus, when he walked, he had a special commitment to 12 people, right? His disciples, he said, I'm, I want you to drop your stuff. I want you to come with me, and we are going to live life together, which they did for three years. And then he said, out of those 12, he had three, Peter, James, and John. He said, you know what? I'm going to have a special relationship with you. You are my inner group. And he spent more time with them and more conversations and more mentoring and more development with, with them. How do you know when those people are the one. Well, how about this? We talk about this, and Sheila talked about the, the whole engagement side of the thing. Think about the, when you were walking, for those who are, are married or have been married, how did you know when you were walking with that someone that they were the one? And, and I love that question because sometimes there's a lot of fun stories in the midst of that. I love comparing the, between the one and the other and seeing if they had the same or if it's completely different. Um, but there is a moment where you go, this is the person. This is the person I want to walk with. This is the person I want to spend my life with. And I'm just going to tell you, it has been uh, 28 years. Is that right? 28 years? I think since I've been married. I'm looking for my wife to nod in agreement. Uh, i just trying to do quick math. Uh, but in that, I am so glad that I asked her to marry me 28 years ago, and I'm not going through that today. Can, can anyone say an amen to that? Yes. And, and for a couple different reasons. The expectation of the engagement moment is absolutely ridiculously high. Right? Like, it's not good just to get engaged. Like, you've got to be on the Today Show with a virtual, like, this is the way we did this. And we had an orchestra that came down, and we skydived down, and uh, there was this moment. I'll, the only thing I was worried about was whether Kristen was going to say yes or not. That was, that was tension back then. But we have built this engagement moment up to be this incredible moment. But I really believe that the incredible moment happens once they do say yes. 
and we enter what is called the engagement. And so let's go back one. In the engagement moment, this is a moment of preparation. This is a, a way of saying, hey, we are getting ready for that wedding day and those wedding vows. We are doing the counseling, and we're trying to figure out our gaps and figure out family history. It's our chance for the people around us, our community, to celebrate the fact that we are taking this relationship to another level. And we are getting ready for this commitment and making these plans. And uh, anyone that has been married or has gone through that, they will say this, it is one of the most stressful times in life. True? <laughs> True. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. This is, this is where I need the evangelicals to come out a little bit, right? Like you can speak during this, right, a little bit. Um, yeah, it's true. Like, it's one of the most stressful things. Here's how I know it. Because we get to walk with those who are getting married. We get to talk through the stress and things like that. This preparation time is really intense. And it's really to come to this thing because we're preparing for what is called these marriage vows. And think of this. In these marriage vows, think about what you're promising in the midst of this. Let's go to the next slide. It says this. That, that I am promising, as you're standing across from this person, you are promising to be faithful to them in all circumstances. That no matter what comes your way, no matter what circumstance it is, no matter what your living um, situation is, in good and bad and poor and rich, all that stuff, that I'm going to be faithful to you no matter what. That I'm going to serve you, that I'm going to think more about you than I think about myself. That I'm going to be loyal to you and to you alone. And then comes these words, until death parts us. I, I mean, have you ever stopped to think in the midst of that moment, like what we are promising the person across from us, until death parts us? Now, some of you are thinking, man, I'm, I'm glad that God shortened the time span life of people these days. Can you imagine what that was like when they were living eight to 900 years? And some of you are like, oh my gosh, this is really hard, this marriage thing. God, I, I, I hope, I hope your, my spouse doesn't live to 98. I'm not saying you would never admit that. I know that. But it is a reality that that is hard. Like this is a really big commitment when we're standing in that moment, right? That is a high bar. You ever think about today that maybe we've started to soften our promises? That we've started to soften our commitments to each other? That we, we've said, well, that's way too high of a bar. I'm, I'm going to do some things that are a little bit more realistic. Because to death parts us is a long time, and I don't know who that person's going to be 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. So instead, I'm going to do a few things a little different. Here's some actual vows that we're committed to. I promise to never watch the next episode of Netflix without you, no matter how much I want to. It's a wedding vow. Uh, how about this one? Um, I promise to continue to defend you when your parents say that you're weird. <laughs> or this one. I promise to have your back even when you're wrong, which is a lot. <laughs> yeah, this is during a wedding vow. That's a very nice comment, right? Uh, how about this one? I promise to love you even when you endlessly go through Netflix and never pick a show. Yeah, I, see, I love when I do this. I can see you elbowing each other, like, in the midst of this. Um, or how about this one? I promise to always let you try my food, even though I told you to order, to order your own thing. Anyone do that? Anyone? <laughs> Here's a few of you. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. You order it. I don't, I don't want any. Oh, that looks really good. Can I try some of that? You ever have that? That's oh, but commitment says this. You can try. You can try because I'm serving you and putting your needs in front of mother. But that's a big commitment. But we've softened that in this day and age. We, we've said the commitment's just too hard to death parts us. And so let, let's, let's back that off a little bit. Let's make it a little bit more committal. How about I, I will be committed to you as long as it works for me. And we've lost something in the midst of that. Well, when we think about Genesis and God's call to Abraham, in many ways, it is, there's two moments to this. In 12, it's kind of like an engagement period. It's God coming to Abraham and saying, I am called you. I want to be in this relationship with you. I'm pursuing you, and, and I want to make this long-lasting, not just for a moment. I want this to be the rest of your life. 
And, and then the other side of it, he comes into 15 and he's preparing him, what we would say is a marriage vow, and he goes through a ceremony that he seals that promise, that marriage vow. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But in the midst of this, let's start with engagement period. And so God comes to Abraham and he says this, there's two expectations I have of you. There's two conditions that I want. I've got some things that in this relationship that I'm asking of you. One of them is this, I'm asking you to go. I want you to go. Now, in contrast, remember last week with the Tower of Babel, we had this moment where they wanted to stay and to make their name great. That, that's, that was their motivation. But God said, no, 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 my people are going people. And so I want you to put on your shoes and get your family, and I want you to go to the land I'm going to show you. Not the land I've already told you, but I will show you. Like, there's a continuation. I want you just to take the next step, and I will start to reveal things. How many out here are like me, where I'd like to go, but I'd like to know where I'm going? I'd like to know the final destination of where that is. Like, God, I, I, I will obey you, but would you give me all the details first so I can say whether I want to do it or not? Or I'll obey pieces of it, but not everything. But he just says this, go, I will show you wherever that's at. It required faith on his part and trust and the second thing he said this, he said this, I want you, or my people are going to be a people of blessing. Like you are to go and to bless people. You are to go into different places and you are going to encounter different people and some people who don't have the best interest of, of my people in mind. And you are going to have suffering and you're going to have trials and you're going to have things, but you are called to go and be a blessing to them, to love on them, to bring my love and my relationship because my heart is to have a relationship with everybody, and I want you to represent that to the whole nation, everyone you come in contact with. So go to where I show you and be a blessing to others. And, and Abraham, before you go, I want to tell you this. I'm giving you six promises. This is what's going to come. I, I'm just telling you, when you do this and when you go, these six things are going to happen as you go. You, this is the God that you have, the God that wants a relationship with you. He says this, your descendants are going to be many and influential. He told him to look up to the stars. He said, all those stars that you could see, that's going to be as many as your descendants. Can you imagine that? Look up at the stars, see how many there are, billions and billions. He said, your descendants will be as numerous as the stars. He says, you're going to have divine favor and provision. You are my people. I'm, I'm ahead of you in this. You will be honored throughout history. We're talking about him today. Your name is going to be known. Interesting. Last week, they made the effort to make their name known. But God says, it is my call to make your name known. It's my call to lift you up in front of others. And it's not about you and who you are. It's about me and being my people. I will make your name great. I'm going to show favor to those who support and honor you. So when people come and they love you and they watch you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to honor them. And if they don't, I'm going to protect you. I'll protect you from the harm and judgment of others. And then he has this promise in 6. He says this, through your line, through your family, through all those descendants, I am going to fix and restore what is broken. I, I'm going to bring it back to creation. And we know in 6, he's talking about his son, Jesus. It's a promise that he comes back into this. He says, I'm going to send Jesus into the story. It's a promise of redemption. I'm going to redeem the story. And think about this. If God comes to you and says this, through your line, I'm going to redeem everything. That's amazing promise that God gives him. Here's the six promises that you have. Now notice what Abraham did. It says in verse four, he says this, he picked up and he went. As the Lord told him, he, he obeyed. He didn't have all the answers. He didn't know where everything was going. He just said, okay, I trust you, God. You've given me the promises. I'm going to go to the land that you show me. And, and he didn't know what was coming. We don't know what's coming in our life, but he was obedient. And I believe this. In today's relationship with God, obedience is his love language. He, he is looking for our obedience. It's our way to saying, we love you, God. We love you, God. And, and so many times, if we're honest, I think sometimes we are in half-hearted, promised relationships. So many times we're like, well, I will love you when it's convenient for me. I'll love you when it works for me. And so many times we enter kind of into this relationship where we say this, I want to pick and choose where I obey. I will obey over here. 
I like this. In fact, this is really good. Not only will I obey it, but I'm going to point out everyone else that's wrong in this area because I, I've got this area down. But I'm not going to do it over here because this is hard. And this, I knew it was going to fall one day. <laughs> I know choir was betting on this like when I was going to fall. Um, I'm not going to do it over here because it's too hard and it requires too much and there's too much suffering in the midst of that. And so I'm, I, I'm not going to do this. And we don't like to point that stuff out in other people's lives because we don't do it. And it's easy to start fig- for, to kind of get into that mentality of things where we pick and choose where we want to be obedient and when we're not. And sometimes we know that God's a God of mercy and he's got a compassion and we are for, his forgiveness people. Praise the Lord for that. But sometimes we enter in this thing because we are forgiven and because of his mercy and because of his compassion, we can have half-hearted commitment to him. That we can say, yes, I will do some things, but not other things. And God is calling us in the midst of this to saying, no, I've called you to be obedient, to follow what I've said to you, to go where I, I ask you to go, no matter where that is, and I've given you my promises. Think about this. Uh, what happens in Genesis 15. Genesis 15, he says this, okay, Abraham, I'm committed to you, not just to you, but to all of my creation, and I'm going to cement it in a ceremony, which is really a wedding ceremony, a vow uh, that takes place. And he says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go get some animals and get these animals, and I want you to cut them in half. And so he does that. He cuts most of them in half, and he lines them up one across from the other, and he creates this lane. And it says that Abraham was, was, uh, became drowsy, he fell asleep, and God visited him in fire. We'll see this throughout the story. Uh, Pastor Joe and I, as we continue through Genesis, you're going to see more fire moments through his story. And he comes with a flaming fire pot and a torch, and he comes right through the middle. And, he, and this is what this ceremony is all about. It's a commitment ceremony. It's a vow ceremony. It's, it's a covenant ceremony that says this. I vow to you I'm going to keep my promises and I'm going to do what I say I'm going to do. And if I don't do it, the same fate that happened to these animals should happen to me. Death. If I don't keep my vows, death should happen to me. And I think about this. Can you imagine if on your wedding day you were to come up and we had this moment, we, we do the message and all these things, okay, now it's the vow time. And the, the pastor gets away and says, this, this, all right, I want you to walk between these animals and say your vows and to say to each other, hey, I'm in this for, for, forever. I'm, in, I'm into this and if I don't keep my vows, if, I'm, if I don't make my commitment, may the same thing happen to me that happens to these animals. What do you think would happen with marriages? My guess is we'd have far fewer. And here's why. It's a really, it's the, it's, it's the highest commitment you can think about. And God says that is the commitment that I've made with my people. In the midst of this moment with Abraham, he said this, all of my people should know I am serious about this. And I Every promise I've made, everything I've said is going to happen. And think about it this way. God loves you so much that he wants a relationship with you so much that he is willing to put his life on the line. And and we know, we know we have fallen short. For all have fallen short of the glory of God. Romans says that. In the midst of this, he said this. Just because you've been disobedient doesn't mean that there's not judgment. There needs to be a judgment. We haven't followed through on our covenant part. And so God said this, your disobedience deserves death. But I'm not requiring it of you. I'm bringing my son. I'm sending him to the cross. He's taking your place. He's taking your penalty He is taking the sins of all the sins that I've done, all the sins that you've done, and he is paying the price of disobedience. You see, disobedience has judgment, and it requires death. That's how much your heavenly father loves you. He sent his own son to redeem you, to restore you, to bring you back into a relationship with Jesus. 
And as we say that, I want to encourage you that the same promise that he gave to Abraham, the same commitment that he gave to not just Abraham, but all of his descendants from that on, he said this, you are to be my people. You are to be my representatives. You are to demonstrate my relationship and my covenant. You are to, to go out into the world. So there's two things he's asking of us. One is this, I'm asking you to go. I'm not asking you to build great buildings where you can just stay and celebrate and make your names great. That's not what I'm asking of you. I'm asking you to leave those great buildings and to go out into the world and to be a blessing to others, to show the love that Jesus has, to get the heart of reconciliation that he wants everyone to know me, to know them as Lord and Savior of your life. He has given that promise to every single one who calls upon his name. We are to go and to be a blessing. If the church were able to get this point, this one piece, if we were to be known as a place that wanted to bless people and to love on people and to care on people, it would figure all the other stuff out. And so here's a challenge this week. Where is God calling you to be a blessing? Where is he calling you to go what name pops into your head that he says, I want you to bless that person. I want you to bless that neighbor, that coworker, that friend, that person uh, that, that maybe that you haven't spoken to a while. Who is that person in your life that God is calling you, is putting onto your mind and saying, hey, go bless them. Go be my representation. Go let them know that I want to walk with them. Whoever that is, when you believe the Holy Spirit has put that person in your, in your mind, now you have a question of obedience. Do you obey him or do you choose to do your own thing? Heavenly Father, God, I pray, would you send your Holy Spirit to help us to, 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 to just get a, a picture of who you've called us to go and bless this week? God, would you, would you help us to have the courage of Abraham just to go where you show us? that you would give us the courage to obey what you've said. Lord, there is such great blessing that we could be in this world today. And I just pray in the midst of that, that you would give us the courage, that you would remind us that your promises to Abraham are the promises you've given to us every step of the way. God, we are your people, and we have your promise and blessing to the world. Help us to go and to be a blessing. And all God's people said, Amen. Yeah.